well as I was saying what I had in mind was to talk to you about an overall view of the drug abuse problem and you may wonder why I as a philosopher am in any position to talk to you about this at all well I became interested in it back in 1958 because my field of study is the psychology of religion and therefore of the different modalities of human consciousness and I heard from various people working at UCLA on mescaline and LSD that um, these drugs appeared to produce states of consciousness very similar to what we call mystical experience or cosmic consciousness and they asked me if I would be a guinea pig and come in and experiment with particularly LSD also masculine and find out what happened and try also to give them as accurate a description of the effects of these chemicals as I could which I proceeded to do uh, I have a certain kind of gift which they call the gift of the gab mm -hmm. and uh, I love the challenge of describing what is supposed to be indescribable they tried out dimethyltryptamine on me which is supposed to disintegrate you completely but I made a bet with the doctors that I would remain coherent and did it was difficult but that's how I got interested and so then I began to explore the sociology of drugs and the first thing I think we must be clear about is that the word drugs is very misleading because we have a harmless social institution called a drugstore that sits on the corner of every uh, city street and uh, nobody feels that the drugstore is a menace then we use the word drug in the word drugged when a person is uh, out dopey vague, confused and among those drugs or chemicals which do alter consciousness there are vastly different substances with vastly different effects ranging from caffeine aspirin alcohol marijuana LSD masculine DMT psilocybin heroin opium and so on and we should treat each one of them separately instead of lumping them all together because they're quite different. Now, to put the cat among the pigeons, and you may know this already, and I may be telling no news, but I want to make a provocative statement. The laws of the United States and the programs government sponsored concerning the use of addictive drugs are a total failure not only a total failure but they're making the problem worse they are so stupid that anyone supporting those laws must be either a moron or involved in the racket it's that bad First of all, we all know that government agencies are self-serving institutions. Let's face it. A person in a government agency wants to keep a job. So we'll consider the Bureau of Narcotics. It is in the interest of that Bureau that there be a drug problem. Because if there weren't, the Bureau would have no reason for existence. And this is true of police matters on a much broader scale because the drug problem is a subdivision of what we will call sumptuary laws. A sumptuary law is a confusion of church and state. It is a law against sin as distinct from crime. In my definition, although these definitions can always uh, be disputed on, as, as it were on the edges, a crime 
is an offence against society in which somebody is injured and is disposed to complain. A person who is robbed, assaulted, uh, simply doesn't want that to happen. But there are innumerable sins, you might call them, because that's an ecclesiastical term, or we might say crimes without victims, such as gambling, prostitution, drug taking, and uh, various forms of sexual relationship. And when you try to regulate these things by law, you invariably enter into a super-colossal mess. Not only is it that um, <coughs> government agencies against these things, they will say narcotic squads, vice squads, and so on, have a vested interest in their continuance, but also by prohibiting them, you put up the price of engaging in them. Take heroin, the price of heroin, and bad heroin at that is colossal. It needs 25 bucks a day to maintain the habit. Therefore, this is one of the most thriving industries in the United States. I have been told that dollar-wise, heroin is the biggest import of the United States. I don't know if this is true. But somebody is doing very well indeed out of it. The perfect cell. Get the person hooked, and in order to maintain their habit, they have to become a pusher. Sell it, or else a rubber. And street crime, mugging, is directly related to the necessity of maintaining the heroin habit. Now, once you make this a matter for police control, you corrupt the police. The police in the United States began to be corrupted at the time of Prohibition. And Mr. Ansinger, who had a job under Prohibition, had to find himself another job. So he selected drugs as the new Prohibition and did very well. He persuaded, uh, by the force of the United States, its prestige, almost all other countries to cooperate in his program and therefore set up by response, by bounce, the biggest international racket going. One wonders sometimes if Mr. Anslinger didn't uh, profit from him. Uh, we can only say that he profited by holding this eminent position. But somebody is making fortunes out of the trade simply because the price is high and the price is high because it's forbidden any idiot should be able to see that in the meantime the police are neglecting their other duties if you have a robbery say in your home they couldn't be less interested in retrieving the stolen goods I know a case that happened fairly recently where uh, the police inspectors didn't come around for two days after the robbery. And then they sent over a couple of goons in plain clothes. Real goons. And, uh, you know, they sort of shuffled around and looked at things and went off. They don't give a damn. Because they've got too much to do. and they're underpaid. So my proposal is in general that the duties of police be restricted to four areas. One, protecting us from robbery. Two, protecting us from violence. Three, directing traffic. And four, giving aid to persons in distress. Uh, the personnel of vice squads and narcotic squads could simply be transferred to these other duties because in all conscience there's enough to do in those four areas then uh, you say well what are you going to do about these other things well let's face it let's be realistic there are going to be people there always have been people 
who do silly things. It's stupid to become dependent on drugs. It's pretty stupid to gamble. But you can't stop people being stupid by law. Nor can you make people moral by law. It is the essence of Christian ideas that morality is of no significance unless whatever is done or whatever is not done is done freely. In other words, it has to be your own voluntary act. A person who is compelled to be moral is not, in Christian view, moral at all, but merely scared. And therefore, we would immensely relieve some of our social problems if we took all sumptuary laws off the books. Legitimize prostitution, gambling, and uh, treat drug taking as a health problem. I think things like marijuana, which are relatively harmless, should be available on the same basis as alcohol. Licensed, not sold to minors, <coughs> what have you. As to harder drugs, I think this is a problem for physicians and health clinics, not police, definitely not police. So, in that case, what would happen? There would be at least a temporary rise, perhaps, in the use of these things. But freedom necessarily involves risk. You cannot have a free country which is at the same time a nursery. Now here's the FDA about to uh, prohibit the sale of vitamins above a certain strength except on prescription. What are they going to interfere with next? As an adult male who has a fair knowledge of these things, I feel insulted by the making of these recommendations into law. I feel grateful to the FDA if it confines itself to giving advice. But when laws are passed so that I can't buy what vitamins I want to buy without a doctor's prescription, I feel offended. I feel that my intellect and judgment are insulted. So I'm perfectly willing to read the books and find out what's dangerous and what isn't, or what somebody's opinion is about what's dangerous and what isn't as medicine is not an exact science by a long shot. But uh, when more and more laws are passed, the situation becomes intolerable. See, we have a very naive faith in law. Everybody says, there ought to be a law against it. So they make a law against it. That makes everything more complicated. Because you can hardly move today without a lawyer to tell you what you may and may not do especially in business, and especially in small business. So we are surrounded with law, and surrounded with officers and officials who are acting supposedly for our own good, but actually acting for their own good, because it's their job. Now, if we took sumptuary laws off the books, we would empty the jails by at least a third of their population. Jails are a jam full of people who ought not to be in jail at all because they're in there for sin as distinct from crime. And they don't feel guilty. And therefore they resent being in prison. And the state of imprisonment merely confirms them in their hatred of society. In California, we're supposed to have the very best jails in the country. Places like Vacaville and San Quentin are supposed to be real far out. They are unbelievably dreadful. Because they're a Kafkaesque situation with people in there on one to ten year sentences. And you know we'll let you out if you show signs of improvement. And nobody knows what they're supposed to do. What is showing a sign of improvement? And will the the probation officers consider that I'm merely showing signs of improvement as a pretense in order to get out so that I can recommence the life of crime. And these then 
uh, psychiatrists and probation officers have very subjective judgments about whether the person is faking or not. So uh, these inmates are in the frightful position of total uncertainty as to how long they will be in there. Don't forget, too, that in the United States, prison means a lot more than being out of harm's way so that you won't harm society. It means sexual deprivation. It means the lousiest diet imaginable. And uh, it is, uh, all penologists pretty much agree that uh, our prisons are schools for crime and sodomy. So when you put the rather sensitive people who tend to become addicts in these institutions, you create an abomination. And there's no answer. And it merely increases the enemies of society. Last, March before last, the Sixth Army sent its top brass to the Esalen Institute. Now, the Esalen Institute you may have heard of, it's what's called a human potential center or a growth center in California where we study everything from religion to psychotherapy to group encounter to all kinds of things, sensory awareness training. And all the top brass came down there for 10 days to study what might be alternatives to drug turn-ons the alternative turn on. And while the public meetings uh, were, as usual, uh, talks involving an immense amount of memorandumese, uh, <laughs> there was a very sensible general there, General Tullison. And in these conferences, you know, all the valuable work is done over the coffee table and not in the public meetings. So, at great length, talking with him and with the chief psychiatrist, Colonel Livingston and Letterman, they absolutely agreed that this could not be solved by police methods. But the public is in such a state of panic and has such a naive faith in the law and law enforcement that a congressman who tries to overturn the situation is terrified of losing his votes. The drug abuse problem is a problem not of those who abuse drugs, but of society at large. And society at large has to be educated. To see that those who are addicts are in fact sick, they are not criminals, and we must look very carefully at the British way of handling the problem, on which there have been some articles recently in the New Yorker that are wonderfully well informed, showing that their problem is nothing compared to ours. Although they still have a problem, but it is a minor. They simply have clinics where if you declare yourself to be a heroin addict, you'll get your supply with the opportunity of consultation with uh, counselors or physicians who can help you kick it. But you can't kick heroin like that any more than you can kick alcohol like that because you get withdrawal symptoms and all kinds of problems. So I think we have to consider the adoption of something like the British system and stop the record. I have some wonderings in my mind as to what the Vietnam War was really about. And then it occurs to me that Laos is the, one of the biggest opium supply sources in the world. And whoever controls Laos is very rich. One remembers the opium wars when the British got control of the opium trade into China. And they made enormous sums of money selling opium to the Chinese. And there it's still sitting a great prize for anyone who can capture it, who gets it. So uh, 
we have to be rather cynical about these things and see and realize that uh, various institutions do not exist for the good of the public but for their own interests and that when you prohibit something by law you automatically sweep it under the carpet or drive it underground where it festers and gets worse and worse and worse everything needs to be brought out into the open to have the sunlight on it it's like for example the city streets the primitive kind of city street where, every, where all sorts of little shops along it and where mamas are sitting looking out of the window or sitting in chairs on the doorway and watch the passing crowd there's far less likely to be crime in those streets than there is in the corridors of a housing development those long, long empty corridors with nobody watching empty streets in nice residential apartment areas where nobody has a shop that's the ideal situation for crime that's why I say bring everything out into the open let everybody watch and then you automatically reduce crime